Today's message comes from 2 Samuel chapter 4, which sounds familiar because we were there recently, but we're going back there and see what else we can find. Let's seek the Lord in prayer before we read the scripture. Heavenly Father, what a privilege, a blessing it is to our souls to read the Word of God together. We pray that the Holy Spirit would open our hearts, minister to us a word in season, give us the bread of heaven and our pilgrimage. Lord, open up an oasis in the desert. Speak to our hearts in a fresh and vital way. Give us tenderness, humility, faith, desire, grace, O oh God, to walk with you, to listen to you, to heed you for Jesus' sake and to your glory. Amen. Well, once again, we're in 2 Samuel chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. And there we read, And when Saul's son heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble, and all the Israelites were troubled. And Saul's son had two men that were captains of bands. The name of the one was Baanah, and the name of the other Rechab, the sons of Rimon, a Berathite, of the children of Benjamin, for Beeroth also was reckoned to Benjamin. And the Berathites fled to Gitam and were sojourners there until this day. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse, and, and his nurse took him up and fled and it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. And the sons of Rimon, the Berathite, Rechab, and Baanah went and came about the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth, who lay on a bed at noon. And they came thither into the midst of the house as though they would have fetched wheat, and they smote him under the fifth rib, and Rechab and Baanah, his brother, escaped. For when they came into the house, he lay on his bed in his bedchamber, and they smote him and slew him and beheaded him and took his head and got them away through the plain all night. And they brought the head of Ishbosheth unto David to Hebron and said to the king, Behold the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, thine enemy, which sought thy life, and the Lord hath avenged my lord the king this day of Saul and of his seed. And David answered Rechab and Baanah his brother, the sons of Rimon the Berathite, and said unto them, As the Lord liveth, who hath redeemed my soul out of all adversity, when one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good tidings, <clears throat> I took hold of him and slew him in Ziklag, who <clears throat> thought that I would have given him a reward for his tidings. How much more, when wicked men have slain a righteous person, in his own house upon his bed. Shall I not therefore now require his blood of your hand and take you away from the earth? And David commanded his young men, and they slew them and cut off their hands and their feet and hanged them up over the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the sepulcher of Abner in Hebron. Amen. And we thank God for the word of the living God. Today we're going to look at this chapter through the lens of the topic of judgment. Judgment. Major Bible theme. The last time we looked at this chapter, we noted the unique way David was tried in his faith through the wickedness of these men. Saul's supposed supporters who turned against Ishbosheth, and they took his head and handed it to him. The sons of Rimon, the Berathite, Baanah, and Rechab, they came expecting to be rewarded by David for assassinating him, but instead were executed themselves after he passed righteous judgment on them. The gospel pattern is too obvious to pass over without comment, so Today we take time to consider the tragedy of these two men who were so typical of many people. The role David took in this incident was as their king and judge. They acknowledged him with deep respect as, quote, my lord the king in verse 8. They were clearly intending to demonstrate allegiance to his rule 
as their anointed king over them and the nation of Israel. They were clearly intending to demonstrate that they gave their allegiance to him, and yet he judged them as wicked for their deed, that they were sincerely certain when they stood before him was good. And this confusion is at the root of what will happen when many people stand before Jesus Christ on the great day of the final judgment. We see this referred to in John 5, 24. So if you'd hold your finger there, if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 5 and verse 24. So that would be the gospel according to St. John. Chapter 5, verse 24. Verily, verily, Jesus is speaking, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. What an encouragement. What a comfort. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that's 24, then 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father have life, hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this. The hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. So he made it very, very clear that his judgment that is coming is over all human beings at the time of the resurrection, the resurrection to life and some to the resurrection of damnation. And he's the one that makes that judgment. And if you turn to the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, You'll see him refer to this as well. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, this is coming down to the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then, while I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There is a time coming for all people, everyone on the planet Earth that has ever been here, when we will all be either resurrected to life or damnation. And it's one event. The sons of Rimmon were condemned as guilty of a capital crime against God and their country and were sentenced to death. And as we see, as we will see, Mephibosheth, Jonathan's lame son, will be, was, will be welcomed at King David's royal table and be feasted. At the end of the world, when Jesus comes back, he will gather all the nations throughout all time to be judged. Why do I say that? Because the Bible says that. Look at Matthew 25, 31. We've just seen a couple of places where Jesus himself taught that. Look at chapter 25 and verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. So he'll be revealed as the king and the judge. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from the other, one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Very clear that there's a distinction, a judgment rendered to all human beings that have ever lived on the planet Earth into two groups. 
And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he goes on to commend them for their works. And you'll see what they are as you read the passage. And if you look on down, the king will answer and say unto them, Hmm. On the left hand, verse 41, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And you'll see why, because of their failure to produce righteous works. Hmm. And you'll see the same kind of thing revealed in Revelation chapter 20. Chapter 20 of Revelation, verses 11. To the, let's see, what verse is it? Chapter 20, verses 11 to 15, to the end of the chapter. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So there's no escaping him. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And that would be hell. The Lord teaches us that the universe as we know it will be completely burned up at the time of Christ's return. Even the elements, even the elements. Look at 2 Peter 3.10, New Testament. Very explicit, powerful, prophetic teaching about what's coming. The Bible tells us about the future. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10 says this, But the day of the Lord, that's the same day we're talking about, the day of judgment, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. People won't know it's coming. It'll take people by surprise, like a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in there shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be? And all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. So we ought to be looking for this, preparing for this. Judgment is coming. And this is what the whole creation, according to the New Testament, Romans chapter 8, verse 21, the whole creation is looking for, groaning, yearning, anticipating for the end of vanity. Chapter 8 of the book of Romans, glorious chapter, verse 21, because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption. And this is based on verse 20. The creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also. That would be believers which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. As William Hendrickson pointed out in his excellent commentary on the book of Revelation, titled More Than Conquerors, and I'm quoting, no longer will this universe be subject to vanity. All individuals who have ever lived on earth 
are seen before the throne. That's in Re Revelation 20. He's talking about the great white throne. The judgment, the entire Bible, he says, teaches but one general resurrection. This one and only resurrection takes place at the last day. And he references John 6.39 and following, and John 6.44 and 54. I'll let you look those up on your own. Nowhere, he wrote, in the entire Bible do we read of a resurrection of the bodies of believers followed after a thousand years by a resurrection of the bodies of unbelievers. All arise at the same time. Death, the separation of soul and body, and Hades, the state of separation, now cease. Neither in the new heaven, nor upon the new earth, nor even in hell, where there, will there ever be a separation between body and soul after Christ's second coming for judgment. End quote. So David's judgment of these wicked men has a faint similarity and parallel to the final judgment. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. We should be careful about how we look at prophetic scripture and make sure that the, the gravity of it sobers us, grips our hearts, equips us for what's coming. Friends, we're going to stand before Jesus. Chapter 5 and verse 10 of 2 Corinthians. What's it say? We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now he's writing to the church at Corinth. Romans 14 and verse 10. The teaching of Scripture, the New Testament, is that Jesus Christ is going to judge us, all human beings. Chapter 14, verse 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The faith David exercised led him to put a higher value on justice than personal gain, as we saw last time. Our Lord Jesus Christ will exact justice at last on that great day. Everything will be judged righteously. Every person will give an answer and be held to account. In light of this, it behooves us to seriously consider whether we are like the sons of Rimon who stood before David or not. Do you expect to be rewarded when you're standing before Jesus Christ for a biblical reason? Or is it all because of your imagination and your wish? Because of what you think he'll like? Do you have biblical grounds for gospel hope, certainty, and light of judgment? Do you have any foundation and eternal truth in God's written word, the Bible, that he will welcome you and commend you on that great day of final judgment so that you will hear him say to you, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. Since it is absolutely certain that everyone who hears this message that I'm preaching today will be judged at last by the great King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, including me, take time with me to honestly consider these questions that are so essential for us in light of eternity. Without spiritualizing the historic incident of David and the sons of Rimon, we can benefit immensely from recognizing the gospel pattern so powerfully presented to our faith in their tragic outcome. First of all, what Bayonah and Rechab based their hope on. When they spoke to David at the judgment, their judgment, they were proud of their achievement. They were certain that it would please David to have this chief rival for the throne delivered right into his hand. Their work was completely natural. They never consulted God about it. 
They did not have any basis biblically for their hope, but their hope sustained and, and compelled them to do this. And they were very clearly expectant and eager to hurry away to David because he would be so pleased with them. And they were certain that they did a very good deed. And after all, it was so, so that David's throne would be secured, and that was good. And he was the rightful heir to the throne, according to God's anointing. And what they did was entirely explained in terms of the flesh. The natural man has a moral compass. We all have a conscience, and we know some things are wrong. We all are selective in our morality by nature, capitalizing on what we find comfortable and attainable and suitable to us, and steering clear of what makes us uncomfortable and convicts us of our failures and our sinfulness. And this is why the moral law, the Ten Commandments, is so effective in exposing our sin when spiritually applied to the conscience. There's an evangelist in California named Ray Comfort who pioneered this use of the moral law, the Ten Commandments, in evangelism. He does it in street ministry. He's online. You should look at, it, at some of his videos. And he teaches people how to address people's conscience by using the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God. People will usually freely admit that they are thieves, liars, adulterers at heart, blasphemers in public meetings in front of other people under his loving ministry. And yet they begin by telling him sincerely that they think they're good people. And that is the power of God's law to penetrate, to pierce, to expose the sin in their heart. The sons of Rimon, and it does it for us, the sons of Rimon certainly were sincere in their hope. They sincerely expected David would be pleased with them when they came and showed him what they did for him. How many people are doing many, many things for Jesus Christ that they think on that final day when they stand at the judgment before him, he'll be pleased with? They say their prayers, and they live a selectively moral life. And you might think, well, what could be wrong with prayer? Read the first chapter of Isaiah. And you'll find out that God hates some prayers. He hates to hear some people pray. And Israel was in that condition in Isaiah chapter 1. Many people are religious and may even sacrifice to serve God and give generously to support Jesus. They attend religious services and work to uphold righteousness. They expect he'll be pleased when they tell him all the wonderful things they've done in his name. But consider the truth of Matthew 7, 21 to 23, and reflect very carefully on that word, many. Many will say to me in that day, and listen to what they will say, Lord, Lord. They will address him with deep, profound respect, like the sons of Rimon did to David. They will base their hope entirely on their works, reminding him of what they've done for him without ever consulting him. And notice how they will speak only about what they have done. <clears throat> and this leads us, secondly, to the only gospel foundation for eternal hope of glory. God shows us how we can be sure that our hope is real, biblical hope, not the expectation of the wicked that God says in Proverbs 10.28, is like a spider's web. Many people have no biblical basis at all for their hope. They expect to get to heaven. They hope to get to heaven. They expect God will be pleased with them because of all the things they've done. But God tells us without faith, Hebrews 11 and verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please God. And he tells us, it's not by works of righteousness that we have done that we're justified. We can't be right with God based on our performance. But it's according to his mercy, his mercy. He initiates it by the washing of regeneration. You must be born again, the new birth, and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. 
Even faith to believe the gospel is the gift of God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. So God tells us over and over again that standing before God isn't based on our performance. It's not how good we are. And yet, there we read in the New Testament several places where they will be judged according to their works. And we see the kind of works in Matthew 25 that he talks about visiting him when he was in prison and, and feeding him when he was hungry and, and healing him, ministering to him when he was sick. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ is absolutely essential to be right with God. His finished work of redemption on the cross to pay in full for all your sins according to his gospel mercy is your only hope of salvation and acceptance with God. And this hope gives us peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, you can stand before the Lord in the judgment with peace in your heart. And you can anticipate that eagerly, with joy, with anticipation, with peace. Look at Romans 5 and verse 1. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. So you can have this kind of peace in face of eternity and judgment. Therefore, in light of all that he's just said, the gospel truth of justification by faith alone, through grace alone, to the glory of God alone. In Jesus alone. Therefore, being justified by faith, chapter 5, verse 1, Romans, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Totally different expectation, and it's based entirely on the finished work of Jesus. Being justified or pronounced righteous, it's not just forgiven. It's even better than that. It's the Lord as, a, as our judge standing. We're standing in his presence, and he says, you are completely righteous. There's nothing wrong with you. Everything about you is right. How does that happen? The moment you believe the gospel, he clothes you in his righteousness, imputes his righteousness to his righteousness, spotless, perfect, pure righteousness imputed to you. By the grace of God, through faith. Being justified or pronounced righteous is all of grace through faith, and it has nothing to do with what you do. We have all sinned and come short of God's glory. That's in chapter 3 of Romans. We all need the precious cleansing power of Jesus' sprinkled blood to cover our sins, and this is why Jesus died for us on the cross. This is why he is our great high priest after the order of Melchizedek and entered in once and forever into the Holy of Holies in heaven, and sprinkled his own blood on the mercy seat, and declared, it is finished. And you'll see that in Hebrews 6, and verse 19, where he said that our hope is like an anchor of the soul that keeps us from drifting off course or being swept along by the raging currents from God's truth and grace in Jesus. It's an anchor that enters within the veil in heaven where Christ sprinkled his blood. Here is the firm foundation that we have for confidence in the day of judgment. So we can have that confidence. Look at Hebrews 3 and verse 6. Confidence in the day of judgment. What a prospect that is. It sounds like a dream, doesn't it? It sounds almost too good to be true. But it's in the Bible, and it's true, and it can be your portion, your experience. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end. So there's that gospel hope that's anchored in Jesus and his finished work on the cross. And there we are, depending entirely on him, and we have a confidence that we hold fast to and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Hallelujah. What a wonderful provision. Look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. I know I'm throwing a lot of scriptures at you, but you can come back and read the notes and find them again and, and take your time. Go through them. They're worth reading again. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, 
and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. There's that gospel hope. Which we have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. This saving faith by the grace of God produces good works. The judgment will deal with us based on our privileges and responsibilities. If we waste what God has given us, it will be possible to be saved as by fire. In other words, for everything that we've ever lived for to be burned up, and yet our soul saved for eternity. 1 Corinthians 3.15 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 15. Yes, I am having to look it up because I don't have them all written down. Chapter 3 and verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Hmm. So as by fire. Wow. Make sure that we are getting recorded. The saving faith produces good works. And burying your talent, taking your talent and burying it, will have awful, awful repercussions. Look at Matthew 25, 24. And this should make you stop and think about what you're doing and how you're living. We all should. Matthew 25, 24 to 30. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, gathering where thou hast not strawed, and I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I would have received mine own with usury, with interest. Take therefore the talent from him, give it unto him which hath ten talents, for unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now this is judgment he's describing. And it's indeed a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You can't honestly read the Bible, the New Testament, without coming up with that conclusion. Our God is a consuming fire, we're told in Hebrews. Our 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith concludes with chapter 32, and what is the topic of the last judgment? Summarizing the biblical doctrine of this vital subject, and it reads in part, paragraph 1, quote, God hath appointed a day wherein he will judge the world in righteousness by Jesus Christ to whom all power and judgment is given of the Father. In that day, not only the apostate angels shall be judged, but likewise all persons that have lived upon the earth shall appear before the tribunal of Christ to give an account of their thoughts, words, and deeds, and to receive according to what they have done in the body, whether good or evil. And then there's a whole string of scriptures that you can look up that, that, that speak, say these things. Paragraph 2, the end of God's appointing this day is for the manifestation of the glory of his mercy and the eternal salvation of the elect, that would be believers, Christians, and of his justice and the eternal damnation of the reprobate, that would be the lost, who are wicked and disobedient. For then shall the righteous go into everlasting life and receive that fullness of joy and glory with everlasting rewards in the presence of the Lord. But the wicked who know not God and obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be cast aside into everlasting torments and punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. End quote. And all the other scriptures that are supportive of that and highlight those teachings are, are quoted, and you can look those up. So thirdly, that brings us to the unalterable eternal consequences of final judgment. 
David gave sentence to execute the sons of Rimon. Did you notice? And it was done. It was done. Commanded as young men, and then it says, and they slew them. He gave the word, and it was done. There was no appeal, no delay. The final judgment will not have any appeal or delay either. Heaven and hell are forever. In his twin roles as king and judge, David pronounced sentence that was unalterable and final. The prophetic pattern points to the final judgment when many will profess allegiance to King Jesus and then tell him of their great works in his name, and he will answer them with words of doom and leave them hopeless for eternity. And it's a horrible thing to contemplate. God's righteousness will be displayed to the entire universe. That day in the judgment of the whole world through the Lord Jesus Christ, he will judge the world in righteousness. How do we know that? Paul taught that in Athens to the philosophers at Mars Hill at Areopagus. If you turn to chapter 17 of Acts and verse 31, because he has appointed, he's commanded all men, verse 30, at the end of the chapter, he commands all men everywhere to repent. Turn from your sins, seek the Lord now, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. How is he going to do that? By that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Jesus is the judge, friends. And we see in this scripture and throughout the New Testament, faith works. Faith produces righteous fruit. Romans 6.22. What kind of fruit did you have in the old dead life that you had before? It produced death. That's what it produced. Verse 21. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants of God, you have your fruit unto holiness. And the end, everlasting life. Wow. Look at chapter 7, verse 4. Romans. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, that would be Jesus, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. In union with Christ, we bring the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit. Works that are produced by faith. In union with Christ. Chapter 8, and verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that produces this. There's a great commentary on the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith written by Samuel Waldron, and in it he wrote this, Salvation is not by works, but its whole point is to produce works. Where a person's lifestyle is not radically altered. There is there no gracious salvation has been at work. Judgment proceeds on the basis of our deeds because our deeds taken as a whole manifest our character and our character manifests our relationship to Christ and the presence or absence of faith in him. There is no text which asserts that the Christian has anything to dread in the day of judgment. There are many texts, conversely, which teach that the true Christian has everything to look forward to in the day of judgment, end quote. And that's from a modern exposition of the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. Friends, there is an eternal heaven and an eternal hell awaiting you and all mankind, me as well. All people will stand before Jesus Christ and give account in that day. What is your confidence? How will you stand on that great day? Have you built your hope, as the hymn writer put it, on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness? Is your hope, is your hope anchored in 
Christ's finished work on the cross and his heavenly ministry as your great high priest in the heavenly holy of holies, have you committed the keeping of your eternal soul to him by faith? Are you free of condemnation because you're in Christ Jesus? That's what Romans 8, 1 teaches. Therefore, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus? Or are you trying to be good enough to merit the pardon of God? Are you still clinging to your works righteousness in order to get to heaven? God deliver you. God deliver you. God save you from self-righteous rags and robe you with his perfect spotless righteousness freely given to all who come in the gospel way with nothing in their hands, simply clinging to his cross. God bless you with eternal life through the everlasting love of God in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Praise God. Samuel Waldron wrote, any doctrine of the love of God which ends up doubting or denying the doctrine of eternal punishment is a false doctrine. It is a doctrine that emasculates God by underestimating his perfect justice and by minimizing the radical evil of sin. Do not confuse firm insistence upon the doctrine of eternal punishment with sadistic delight in it. Amen. It was the one who could with profound accuracy say of himself he was gentle and humble, who in the scriptures most frequently and insistently and vividly warned of the danger of eternal fire. End quote. Thomas Watson, the great Puritan, wrote in his Body of Divinity, if you would stand acquitted in the day of judgment, then number one, labor to get into Christ. Two, keep a clear conscience. Three, trade with your talents, and four, get a sincere love to the saints. I would be remiss to leave the sobering topic without reminding you that David's last words highlight the fact that the confidence of believers in the day of judgment is based entirely on God's covenant promise to us in Christ. Read carefully 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 through 5 for yourself. Base your hope of eternity in heaven with Jesus on God's new covenant promise. And look at that new covenant. You'll find it in Hebrews chapter 8 and Jeremiah chapter 31. Old and New Testaments, you'll find it there. Read it carefully. And because of this, live for God's glory. And when you sin, remember, you and I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Our confession of faith, 1689 London Baptist, concludes with the words of Revelation 22:20, 20, Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you'd bless your word to our hearts. That unlike Rimmon, the sons of Rimmon, Rechab and Baana, Lord, that we wouldn't stand before you shocked with nothing to say. Lord, that we would hear, each and every one of us would hear on that final day, well done, good, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Father, we pray that that everlasting joy would be the portion of everyone that hears this message that every one of us would trust in Jesus, every one of us would produce fruit in union with Jesus, every one of us, Lord, would visit the sick, would visit you, Lord, when you're in prison, would remember the poor. Every one of us, Lord, would have a heart for the kingdom of God and produce fruit. Take the talents that you've given us and and employ them wisely and have an interest, have an abundance to give to you on that great day. Lord, the judgment is coming. Prepare us, Lord. Cover us with your righteousness. Fill us, Lord, with your spirit. Prepare us 
for that great day as we ask it in Jesus' name and His glory. Amen. God bless the word of the Lord to your hearts. Amen.